Okay, hello everybody, please take a seat. This is 17th these lectures uh, for two years. Let me introduce our tremendous guest from Germany, Professor Peter Herrmann, sociologist, economist, political scientist, or I should say social philosopher or philosophical sociologist, so you can you know tell me more details about it. Uh, he was linked mainly with German universities, uh, with Bielefeld, with Leipzig, with Hamburg, but also with Italian one, with Irish, yes, core college, with Chinese, so I'm happy that there are a lot of Chinese students, so you will better understand this, the idea, the idea and the concept of the lecture. And the main interest of uh, Professor Hermann are the society, generally, society or modern society, and the link between society and the organization. Also, uh, as I know, the role of NGOs, yeah? and also this, it's included the politics, and you managed to say like the bypassing the state nations, yes? so the, the links between the, uh, the, the policy of, uh, of particular states, and mainly in European Union. And today's lecture will be focused on the, sorry for the words, it's in quotation, the Bush Jobs. The Bush Jobs, the inspiration for Professor, there was a book of David Graeber uh, with the title, it's uh, The Theory of Bush Jobs, yes, let, let's can say it like this. And uh, the main question, so it's a, uh, because I do not want to force it, but it's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really curious of it, so which jobs are more or less bullshitable, and, so, and also indicate uh, are our jobs, it's also the lecturers, are bullshitable or not. So if you include it in the lecture, I will be happy of it. And we made this such a schedule that uh, professor will conduct the lecture about 45 minutes, and later we'll be very open to collect questions and maybe there will be good discuss. So, Professor Herman, Peter, the floor is yours. I know I, I, I forgot about maybe the most important for our faculty, that you were awarded of Exos Fellowship uh, um, uh, grant. So we, have, we are happy that you stay here and you will stay here with another, another month. So thank you very much. The floor is yours. Okay, I thank you. I don't know, is it possible to understand me in the back as well? Without using the microphone? No, I think it's better okay. to use. Okay. So, uh, what it is about, I'll try to answer a little bit these questions. Uh, of course, I can only try it because I'm, I'm not allowed to, it because I'm talking about me and myself uh, as well. So, I have to be positive. And at the same time, this is something we are not allowed to be too positive about ourselves. Uh, you have had time to read this, and this is a little bit background of the lecture, uh, that we are doing, in many cases, something we actually don't want to do. And we are there in a vicious cycle, and we are entered into it, and I say we are entered into it, uh, meaning we are not doing freely, not deciding freely uh, what we are, what, what we want. So the question is uh, another one, uh, that we are not talking about something that we like or dislike. But what I really want to do is to talk about the economy, economic side uh, of it. So what is more suitable than to start with the Queen? The Queen asked a question when there was the crisis, uh, asked the LSE, London School of Economics and Political Science, uh, there are so many intelligent people around. Why didn't you get this in advance? Why couldn't you warn us? And the answer was, it is not a question of whether it's, uh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so where, is the prob where was the problem? Everyone seemed to be doing their own job properly on its own merit. And I think this is what, very important, on its own merit. And according to standard measures of success, 
they were often doing as well. And then it goes on in the answer, the failure was one of the collective imagination of many bright people. So all working on their own behalf, all working in their own area, but not being able or not be not, not uh, in a position to coordinate, to work collectively. Now don't say or suggest that I would say about the Queen, about the people in the academy, that would be bullshit jobs. B may stand as well for a beta group. We are trying hard and we have difficulties to get there. But before leaving this nasty term, I would invite you just to say once collectively this nasty word, bullshit. Just you see, it's not uh, appropriate to do this in such a position, in, in such an environment. But the definition of it by Graeber, by uh, David Graeber, is a bullshit job is a form of paid employment that is so completely pointless, unnecessary, or pernicious that even the employee cannot justify its existence. So, as part of the conditions of employment, the employee feels obliged to pretend that this is not the case. So there you see the tension, the contradiction. On the one hand, you know it is wrong, it's something you shouldn't do, There's, it's pointless. On the other hand, you are not in a position that you can say, but it is pointless, so we'll stop it. There are many sentences where people had been described as background for his work, uh, Graeber's work, uh, where people described where they felt it is pointless. Huge swaths of people spend their days performing tasks uh, they secretly believe do not really need uh, to be formed. So it is this feeling of people doing this work, uh, but I'll, I'll skip all the, the reading, uh, but not being in a position to admit it publicly. So, I won't go into details of Graeber. His interest is a different than mine, and his interest is more one of psychological concern. Why are we behaving? This is his question. Why are we behaving? And why is a system actually paying for people in this way, knowing that there is no point? Economically, first and foremost, it does not make sense. And I want to try to prove a little bit that it makes sense. Empirically, at least some data uh, where you see what he found out where there is no point in doing. So 10%, 12%, this is quite a number where we think, the system pays for 10%, let's take this as a, as a kind of average, 10% of waste. It's kind of astonishing and it is something where I would say it still makes sense even economically. Economically, in a wider sense, and in another piece of work, uh, Graeber says actually, the economy is about producing goods, producing commodities, but it is about something else. It is about producing relationships and producing personalities. The economy is not just this process that aims on making exchanges, producing and exchanging them, but it is about more. These relationships, the personalities, and we are all in one way or another involved in this. Now, there are many ways of thinking about econ economics. And you find this simple way, and then you find behavioral economics, you find institutional economics. And I recommend you, that's a little present uh, if you want to make a career in economics, uh, think about absurd economics. Go to Sweden then, if you are good, you may get this Nobel Prize, so-called Nobel Prize, 
the spherics, Riggs, Banks, Pries, uh, e Economics, Wetenschaft, uh, Alfred Nobel's meaning. It is not by Nobel, it is a prize by the bank. We should never forget this. I think one of the major problems of economics is actually that we consider things working in a rational way, but behind there is something else going on. And this is a highly irrational thing, working together or even actually not working together. So I will go into eight points uh, where I say the beginning is that we are thinking about economics and acting in economic processes as individuals. Methodolog methodologically, we cannot think about something that is collective uh, when it comes to uh, economic behavior. From here, there are different stages of development uh, of contradictions. And this leads at the end to what I said, it's an absurd system. It doesn't make sense. And because it works, it needs this absurdity. This is the paradox. It's, it's always the paradox uh, with absurdity. So let's come to the first point of individualism. It's not about individuals acting. Of course, we are always acting as individuals. But the point here is that we only can think economic uh, behavior in terms of this individual per perspective. Now, the problem with it is that things do not exist individually, meaning they do not exist in insulation. They are linked together, and they are part of my interest. How does society work? It works beyond these individual acts, and it is about how we make our living, meaning it's not about the market as such, but it is about us, all of us, how we make our living. What is faded out in classical economics, in the broad sense classical economics, is this reference to daily life, production and reproduction of daily life. It is about irrationality. In economics, we cannot think, we cannot accept irrationality. And the third and possibly the major point is power. Economics is always a system where people with different powers, this is contradicting mainstream economics, are acting with each other or are acting against each other. There had been this nice thing and still is that tried to bring this together and this is the firm. The enterprise, where you go in the morning, in English we say nine to five jobs, usually it's from six to, then you have your eight hours and you have three shifts during the day. Uh, the idea is bringing together different people, working together, although they are actually not really belonging together, kind of forcing them together. So the, you have the power there, and it is about trying to get hold, trying to control the tension within the system. It is about securing the disembedded economy, because economy is disembedded. Uh, Karol Pol Polyani was talking about this. It is only the market. It's not society that controls uh, the economy, economic processes. It is the market. The market defines what is called value. It's not society. It is about channeling communication, meaning we are not talking about anything else than the production of commodities. And it is about the contribution, and there would driver come in uh, directly affirmative. It is about controlling political processes. If you are in the enterprise and you are depending on your boss, you will behave as the boss demands a very simple economic fact. So let's move from there to the second point. 
it is relatively easy to think about contradictions between one and the other, dichotomies. But it is difficult to accept that within a system there are contradictions as well. So a very simple example, within a firm there are human beings, not economic machines. Some may say, unfortunately, but this is a fact we have to deal with. And this is as well something when we talk about neoliberalism, as we always do, frequently do today, I think we should stop it, uh, because of this. Neoliberalism as term suggests this is one system. It's coherent. At the same time, Keen Birch made uh, uh, systematically uh, uh, um, aware of this. It is about contradictions, the relationship between corporate entity and corporate monopoly. So we are talking about competition, and then we have mon monopolies in all areas. Then we are talking about uh, the increasing propensity towards rentiership over entrepreneurship in an economy supposedly based on market dynamism. So it is another uh, uh, contradiction. And finally, he makes, uh, he, he makes the point of the importance of contract and contract law, free individuals, versus uh, rather than markets in the organization of capitalism. So it is again something uh, what the map did for the space. And here I come to this point of, of society, of thinking, thinking in terms of market, what the map did for space, translate nature, natural phenomenon uh, into an artificial and intellectual conception of that phenomenon. We don't think about reality, we think about reality in a map. We see the map in front of us. Uh, another technology that mechanical clock did for time. We are not thinking about time, we are thinking about minutes and seconds and hours. This is very clearly defined and Time becomes linear in terms of measuring, in terms of thinking, and now we have a new code. This one. It started early. I'm not able to use this technology. It started early with a Morse code. It went on, actually it started even before, with Leibniz, Leibniz and others uh, thinking about computers, thinking about dichotomic binary systems, binary codes, and what you have there, the 0-1 game, is something that is hidden here, that is hidden in the punch card and that is making our computers work. And it is something that makes our brain work. We are thinking in dichotomies, having a job or not having a job, and uh, having this way of communication. Postman comes to the conclusion that this introduction, in terms of a mass communication, was leading to introducing on a large scale irrelevance, impotence, and incoherence. This is what we are communicating today. There was a funny story uh, inventing the telegraph, but not knowing for what. And he said at the end of the day, we ended up uh, being able to communicate over distance uh, into a broad, flapping American ear will be that Princess Adelaide was whooping cough. It doesn't make sense. I don't have to know it. But this was the technological thing it was possible to do this. And it closely links into economic issue, issues. You have an economist actually at the time, he was amongst others, uh, economist Charles, Charles Babbage. He said, we have to introduce this division of labor, fragmentation into the economic system, division of labor, which means increasing productivity and this means we are able to cut cost. This was a long time before our time. And still we have the same pattern. 
And still we have had the same pattern in the early 1900s with Taylor measuring every single act we do in the enterprise. And we have it today. That's my kind of leisure time activity with Google. Leisure time activity talking about digital economies and this stuff. Google is working exactly according to this principle, making everything calculable. It doesn't make sense, or it is not important what the outcome of it is, but what is important is that we get a result. Look up the term budget. Don't think about a budget, household budget, state budget, or whatever. You will immediately go to budget car. So basically, it is reduced, fragmented uh, thinking as well. Spectaculous. What is on topic, what is on vogue today, this is what matters. It is amazing if you look up on Google, actually, some classical terms. Ariadne. A heavy metal group, I think. Ariadne is not about the Greek ancient, uh, ancient uh, mythology, mythology. So it is in this way looking at what is en vogue, what is spectacular. And this is as well the economic thinking, what is spectac spectacular. Ireland, I, uh, it had been mentioned, I came from Ireland, I was there during the boom phase. The boom phase was obviously spectacular, and it was obviously doomed to fail. There was no point in developing a sustainable development on, uh, perspective on this ground. So the idea behind it, in terms of the, the mental shift going on with it, in terms of economics, is that we have had first a switch um, from or towards what we possess, status, and now we are defined by what, by, by what we possess, what we own, goods, commodities. And now it is increasingly how we appear, what is spectacular about it, the kind of dresses, the kind of motor races, the kind of uh, outstanding events we attend. Individual reality, meaning we as individuals, coming back to the first point, uh, are only relevant if we are, or are only real, if we are in, in a position that we make a, show, uh, make a show out of it. It's an amazing thing that you can see, be honest, if you buy any goods. You are not looking really at the use value, you are not even looking at the exchange value. Is it cheap enough or can I afford it? But what you are looking at, what we are looking at, is in many cases, does it look nice? Uh, is it fancy? Uh, these things. These are relevant. Now we have with this an amazing um, variety of products. But at the same time, we need some reinsurance. We need something where we are looking at eliminating, basically, this security, uh, this openness. So we are, uh, as well, and this is a very crucial point, looking at economy always being a matter of the economy of time. How do we spend time, for what do we spend time, and where do we have actually time uh, available? Free time, whatever this means in uh, terms of um, the, the, the content of it, what we do with it. Now, I could go on. It's actually an interesting thing. Uh, if you look at people who don't know our concept of time, uh, who are thinking time in a different way, not in a linear way. It's an amazing thing, long stories, 
And the problem is really what shows our relationship to time. It is everything is commodit commodified. This is the central point of reference. Again, this fragmentation that comes up again and again that is actually allowing or limiting the space for action. And it is about this reduction of diversity. Industrial production, and we always think you can buy everything. There's so much on the markets. It's amazing. You go in the shop, you are standing there half, of, half an hour in front of the, sh uh, of the shelf, and you don't know what to buy. You have to decide. This is what happens in reality. It's a huge reduction of diversity. Industrial production means streamlining. You cannot deal with diversity, and even more so, you cannot deal with derivations. If something is not according to the line of production and to the line of advertisement and to the line of consumption, then you are in trouble. So this is about diversity and actually the fact that it doesn't really exist. And then we come to what I said, it's the sanctification, sanctification of the prophet. Scientification. There is something in this word, uh, uh, pun, pun as well. Uh, it is actually suggesting that whatever we are doing is something we are doing according to scientific rules. And this is this holy thing, this is this saint thing. Whatever we are doing is, or the problem behind it is, the division, the separation of the metabolic character, meaning of the real character of production, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the question of using of concrete work, of concrete labor. What we are doing, you all heard about this term alienation, is highly part of this. It's not just a psychological process, although it is of course involved, but it is about this alienation in terms of the separation of what we are doing. In general, in economics, of course it is of higher value if you really produce something that has an outcome, that has a physical outcome, that has some immediate value in terms of use value. So those who are really working on this, lectures don't, so, um, have problems and should be paid lower. But at the same time, of course, you can say lectures have this outcome of students that they are then productive, so we are okay. But the problem here is that there is a turn that we have actually the determination of value, which, not the determination, but the valuation of something, if it is not producing concrete things, high administrations, um, banking people in the Lehman Brothers who are not thinking they are just going into a crisis, they are paid huge amount of money, whereas those people who actually work and produce something, they are paid less. So what you have here in economic terms, you have kind of communicating vessels, meaning the free lunch, so-called free lunch, they have in the top floors, it is paid by those at the bottom. In economics, we talk then about value chains and all this, but it is always the problem that you have poverty change. Those who are really doing the work, Foxconn in China producing all the phones and whatsoever, they are get, getting paid little. But those who are doing a little bit the design in Silicon Valley, they get a huge amount of it. They have excellent working conditions and all this. 
So this is a story we have to recognize more firmly in economics as well. Where is the actual value produced and where is it um, actually consumed or actually uh, yeah, consumed in terms of the, the income. Now part of this is that of course the design or the programming is not a major thing. And there is one type of job uh, Grebel looks at. It is making good for the mistakes others do. Some people not working properly, so somebody has to do the real work afterwards and repair it. You all know this. After one year, uh, your computer breaks down. Well, it's one year and one day because then the warranty is off and then you have to get it repaired. You just upload, upgrade a software and what happens? A day later, you get another upgrade. So these things are important in terms of an economy that is short-term fragment-oriented, fragment not able to build a perspective, long-term perspective. This is as well about keeping in business, maintaining business. And we have this in academia as well, and now I want to come to your point uh, really, and I'm, I'm wondering where, I'm myself wondering where the border is. I look on the internet on something, uh, well, first I, I had been reading something, a reference um, to something as more useless gadget we have, as more useless people, economically useless people we have. So this was um, Erich Fromm referring to Marx. I checked in Marx didn't find what he was talking about, read the entire three volumes, was hugely interesting, was really exciting to read them again, that's the, the capital, um, and I read them again, I say. Now the question is, I enjoyed it. I, it. It was really great. I found something interesting as well for this lecture, but is this a job that is necessary, or shouldn't we consider that um, Mr. Fromm should have made proper references. Reference. Now this is something perhaps not really important, especially as I enjoyed it. But it is relevant as well when, when we look at something else. It is 10 calories we need to produce food that has one calorie. 10 calories invested to produce one calorie. There's something wrong. If I need three days to check a quote which is not properly referenced and like it, we can say, okay, fine, go ahead. But if we as global society have to produce one calorie, uh, calorie we need with using 10 calories, there is something where we have to think another time what we are doing with these jobs. And this is the problem with all this, that we are not doing, actually, our economies are not doing what I said in the beginning, rational exchange. A produces a commodity one, B produces a com commodity two, and they exchange one against two, a little bit. Half of one against half of two. Now this is a very simplified, but you can make it comple more complex and you still end up there. This is the idea behind our economic thinking, but in reality, then, you have the, uh, I, I quote here now, thus, for example, the exchange value of a machine is not determined by the quantum of working time which it replaces, but by the quantum of working time which, it work, uh, which is worked up in itself 
end which is therefore intended to produce a new machine of the same kind. So you don't exchange goods, you don't exchange values against, uh, uh, exchange values against commodities against commodities, you don't exchange commodity against money against a commodity, but now you exchange some abstract values. They are not interlinked. And it still works. So we are not talking about exchange of use values, but we are talking about the exchange of abstract values. It is kind of interesting in, in, in terms of looking at this absurdity. We know it doesn't, it cannot work. And this is why we always run again and again, every 10 years or something like this, into a crisis. But still, we have a mechanism that makes good for it, and then we are happy again. If it's a global crisis like the one in 2007-2008, it's more serious, we think a little bit more about it, and we are back on track. Ireland is again this glorious country, uh, and I know, I have to write some reports there regularly, I know it doesn't work. Precarity, unemployment, foreign direct investment, which does not bring the money back to Ireland. Uh, Apple owes 14 billion uh, to, uh, taxation, uh, tax uh, payment. These are things that cannot work. And we, there we have the equivalent, and th this is important for me to understand this, the equivalent between pragmatic production, pragmatic markets, uncoordinated, and as well, fragmented identities. My identity is this jumper. My identity is this jacket. My identity is this computer. My identity is this car. Even if it is the car which I gave away because I don't want a car anymore. So this is our way of thinking, and this is the, even more so, uh, getting important with the difference between material products and non-material, non-tangible products. This is, we are made up, we are making ourselves up with ideas. It is amazing that this increasing, that if, if we observe this increasing distance to the materiality of goods. And we have this, of course, as part of a long development. Uh, Clark Colin was working on this, and there are uh, economists more immediately what I'm talking about. Primary sector, meaning agriculture, raw material, and this stuff, and then moving on secondary industrial production, uh, tertiary uh, the, the service production. And then we are going on and going on, getting more differentiated at the end, but we lose this contact, if you want, to the soil. And I'm not pleading for any uh, retrospective uh, celebration of, of the good farming. This was the real and only work. But it is something we have to keep in mind, and it is something in keeping in mind as well, uh, Veblen writing about positional goods. The goods define our position. And this is about the self-destruction then. What I mentioned already implicitly before or explicitly but in a different context, the value chains or poverty chains. We have this artificiality of societies mediated by commodities, by what we have and by what we appear, in terms of building little clusters, in terms of people selling their limbs, selling their bodies, literally. It's frightening if you see the 
the, the trade, international trade with organs. And then, of course, you have prostitution. And then you have another cell in your body. You incarcerate yourself in gated communities. There is no immediate communication. You have all your little segments that are socioeconomic uh, um, uh, segments in which we apparently live. And there is a kind of economic factor in the strict sense coming now to these jobs. As we are dealing with the relation between what we invest in terms of machines, raw material, and labor, we have to balance this. On the one hand, we get higher profit if we increase the part of non-variable capital, as we say, of non-wage, the, the non-wage part. At the same time, we decrease the rate. The real value comes out of labor. That's why it's so expensive. And there is this paradox of if we reduce the investment to such an extent that at the end we don't have any laborers anymore, we have to get some laborers. doesn't matter what they do. Even if they are sitting around, what Gravit talks about, sitting around, making games, at least it is, in terms of investment, a positive thing. And there we are with this absurdity that we are not looking at the reality, but we are looking in economics indeed at equations and figures, and we are calculating something that is detached from uh, reality. I mentioned Google before, and there you are. What Google says, it's not what I say, it's not what critical researchers say. Google Silicon Valley headquarters, the Googleplex, is the Internet's high church, and the religion practiced inside its walls is Taylorism. This is not what they say. The company, says CEO Eric Smith, is founded around the science of measurement. Full stop. That's it. It's not about values. It's not about needs. It's not about anything. It's about uh, measurement. It's striving to systemize everything it does. We try to be very data-driven and quantify everything, as another Google executive, Marissa Meyer going on and going on, and it is this kind of so-called rationalization that we find. We are not thinking about reality, we are not thinking about what people need. We are thinking simply in what is called algorithm, and nobody really understands, uh, because they are relatively complicated, um, but they work. And they bring us somewhere, and they always bring us somewhere into these situations, we have to decide in advance without being able, without having measures there. For instance, the famous case of self-driving vehicles, uh, what is the decision if there are three, what did I hear yesterday, a case again, three pregnant women uh, with a pram and three old people. How should you program the car to behave? This is a situation, a real situation in hospitals as well today, where people have to calculate uh, in advance what they are doing, what it is about. Now, coming back to ancient mytholo mythology, Ariadne's threat. That was a uh, way out, finding, holding this thread and finding the way out of the labyrinth. A princess, of course, involved, it's always nice, and a hero then being saved, being saved by the princess. We have another Ariadne, it's not the heavy metal or something like this bend, but it is in logics as well the same principle, 
logics and IT. It is the way of problem solving where we actually uh, make a, a diary and decide on different steps, fragmented steps, A and B, how do they behave together, B and C, C and D, and there we have a complex field where we have this thread at the end which is calculated and which is composed of individual uh, calculations. And there we have actually, I said economics and economy is about power. We have as well this dimension of different ways, different organizational forms of production. How do we organize production? It's not so much how do we exchange, but it is how do we organize production. I propose to come up with three things. We have what is still today the traditional corporation, which is looking at exchange values, which is not really interested in producing something that is really useful. It has to be useful, otherwise nobody buys. But it is, a, in a way, it's a secondary aspect, which is as well about abstract labor. I'm not interested what you do, I'm not interested how you do it, but I'm interested in the abstract figure of this abstract labor. Then we have the independent work, the SMEs, the workshops, and possibly as well these Uber driver and uh, things like this, so-called sharing economy, where we have directly negotiated uh, values and concrete work. Although with this direct negotiation is, of course, something can you really, or do you have the power to directly negotiate? And then we have the, co uh, the cooperative sector. We have increasingly a discussion on commons, where we can say this is about use value. And the use value is about producing something that is concrete, but as well, it is about consciously including this reference to relations. We look for working conditions, not to increase profit, but to have relations that are valuable for the people who are working there. Now it goes on, and uh, it would be important to look at the uh, details in a, in a further um, discussion. The really important point here is, at the end, the first corpora uh, corporation is looking at prices. Second is looking at value in terms of production. And there is in English language the differentiation between value and values. And values is what we usually call the subjective, more subjective, moral, ethical aspect of what we are doing. But this is economically defined and not really on this abstract level. So this is important to keep in mind when we are talking about um, the perspective we can develop and we have to work on for the future. As I said, it is about the value of producing one calorie with 10 calorie input. It is about thinking about energy efficient nutrition. What we usually eat is the most energy inefficient stuff. So we have to be more conscious about it, but we have to be as well um, in terms of production, more oriented to organize it, organize things in this way. The pancake people. This is, we are spreading out, it's my foreman, I think, a quote, we are spreading out, but we are getting flat. 
we know more and more in terms of we have access to more and more information, but we are not really in a position to deal with this information. Is it frightening? Probably it is. This is where we are at, and this is what we appreciate. Not seeing, not hearing, and not speaking. And not hearing is as well something not being here, not being in reality, but being in a dreamland. As individuals, it's so nice to dream. It's so nice to escape. It is about this not being here, being hyper-individuals. Even if we communicate with others, we are these hyper-individuals. We behave as little princesses and prince, princes and princesses. And there is this monkey story, the fourth monkey, actually. This is the princess and prince as a fourth monkey, not asking questions. We are not critically asking questions about the reality, meaning we are not supposed to question the jobs we are doing. We are giving answers without knowing what we answer. We are not looking at the question first and really looking, thinking about the question. We answer in advance and we are managing not by doing, but as doing. The main thing is we are acting. And from there, I would suggest we can come up with the ABC of the BJS. These jobs. Appointment provide, appointments provide glory. I'm so busy, I can't, I, I, yeah, there may be 10 minutes I can meet you there. We are collecting appointments. If you are really busy, that's great. So A. B. Boosting the number of completed forms increases the security and uh, replaces proper management. Forms, that's important. Fill in forms, there's another form. There was actually, it's not so new, there was a song by a chansonnier in, in, in the 70s. 60s probably, uh, you have to apply with this form to get this form that enables you to apply to another form. So it's this long chain of dealing with forms, not with people. So A, B, and C. C is capital reinterpreted being the thing in itself. It's about capital, it's not about commodities. Uh, it increases the main thing. So as more as we have, as better it is. And this is a deception. As I said, we are in the short run making profit, increasing the capital, but there is something behind it. There is something behind it that we know. The emperor's new clothes. This is this preempting, this is this shallowing of interaction, and it is something that we are kind of dealing with every day. It is, as I said, about economics, and as such, it is about power. And as such, it is as well about civil courage. And it is here where you come to this point. It is much safer to celebrate civil liberties than to defend them. We are not talking about it in public. We, everybody individually is kind of aware of well, is wrong. But to stand up is a difficult thing. And to be able to be public about it, 
and to engage publicly about these things is actually dangerous. And it is really dangerous. You may be torn in part. Thank you. Now uh, we have a time for asking the questions. And so I recognize that there was not only inspiration of David Graeber, but also Aristotle, Marx, Beblen. So it's, uh, uh, if I can say it's in, it's in one sentence, it was the uh, lecture about the wastage and the main wastage of time. Uh, so are there any questions? Be brave. Do not worry, you are not stupid question. Uh, Mr. Dr. Tomasz Drabowicz, you are. Uh, I have actually, first of all, thanks for for an um, excellent uh, uh, lecture, which definitely wasn't a bullshit job. Uh, and I'm not in uh, But I have... Uh, I have two, two questions uh, uh, for you after, uh, after hearing. Uh, uh, one is more more uh, uh, general. One is, I think, uh, more concrete. The concrete is uh, quite Leninist. What is to be done? Uh, yeah, so so whereas I might agree with your diagnosis and especially that part about uh, growing bureaucracy uh, the, the, the information overload uh, then my practical question is how to yeah, you, you, you ended saying that it's, it's better to it's, it's easier to celebrate the, the freedom rather than defend it. But then, how do how how do we how do we change the relationship, the relationships in which we we are entangled, so that uh, that we don't uh, that we don't lose our time on engaging in bullshit jobs. So that's the that's the uh, that, that's the concrete uh, question. Uh, the, the the more general is something you you, you told uh, 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 about hyper the excesses of hyper individualism uh, that, that are inherent in, in, in contemporary. And my question here would be, uh, okay, and uh, what, who decides what is the excessive individualism, what's hyper in, hyper individualism? And don't you think that without addressing that question, uh, uh, we might end up uh, uh, not addressing very important power relations it is because those who can legitimately decide what is an excess of individualism have power over others. So that's that's my two phase. Professor, up to you. If we can collect the questions and later you will sum up, as I think it's a good idea. Uh, Professor Konecki. Okay, uh, I have uh, one methodological question. This is the first question. Uh, you said um, at the beginning about not needed job, yes, but for whom, and how you defined it, and how is, uh, I have completely different perspective than uh, maybe it comes, the question comes from my perspective. Uh, we uh, can say that my job, for example, my job as a sociologist is not needed uh, um, because I, for example, I cannot sell my knowledge on the market, but I am experiencing it. This uh, feeling of the 
not be the job waste of time that I'm spending for the research is experienced by me. And I, in, in this moment, when I experience it, I can uh, testify by the narration, by the description that uh, it's not needed. Then, in your perspective, how you can prove from the individual perspective of the person that the, do the job that is not needed. This is the methodological question. And uh, another thing, what do you think about such a concept by Coser, uh, greedy institutions? Because uh, he did the analysis of Bolsheviks uh, in such a party, you know well, uh, and uh, Jesuits that was the ideal types for him to define specific kind of institutions. Uh, he called them greedy institutions that is uh, incorporating the personality totally that people uh, lose the distinction of job and free time, uh, they are completely engaged in their activity, and uh, they lose the sense of the distinctions in many spheres of life. Uh, they are cut from the family grounds, from the traditional communities and so on. And it happened in Google that you gave the examples and we had uh, many such institutions, and including the universities uh, uh, in, in the Western countries at least, that uh, endeavor us and uh, completely we are engaged in our work uh, 24 hours. Uh, what do you think about such tendency in contemporary uh, civilization that we are going in the direction of greedy institutions and we want to be in greedy institutions. This is the voluntary access to them, like to the Bolshevik party and to Jesuits uh, also um, this uh, Catholic uh, church section. Okay, thank you very much. Irwan, Professor. Professor, my question is about, uh, you told us we are not uh, hearing, we are not speaking, we are not seeing anymore, we are three monkeys. And I want to ask about, uh, do you think that is the academia is not hearing, is not seeing, is not speaking anymore? No. Because in the academia, everywhere it's a summer, there is no witness. And I want to ask this. I am Professor Janusz Wielkowski. Yes, I have just a short comment, maybe a question. Well, uh, don't you think that, uh, that besides uh, bullshit jobs, there are also bullshit, bullshit tasks? Uh, so there are perhaps uh, jobs which uh, have a positive influence on the society, but there are some tasks which, has to, which have to be implemented, which are completely bullshit. Okay, are there any more? Professor Ryszard Piasecki. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your excellent speech, very inspiring. We could discuss till the afternoon and even the evening all these aspects. However, I would like to <clears throat> make a short comment, is that all you have said refers to linear culture, okay? European, American culture mainly. Concept of time, concept of a lot of things, but in this room, we have a lot of distinguished students. They come from other cultures, like China, and many other countries who have different approach to a lot of things. And this is maybe, uh, maybe we should also take it into account that the West is not necessarily winning now the whole, I would say, game in the world. As you know, maybe the latest book of Marco Bani is saying that the, left, the West has already lost and now Asia, and Asian values are coming back. So maybe uh, we, should, we should make it a bit relative. All you have said is linear culture, maybe European and American. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And the last question, you want. 
Um, I have a question in terms of that people are afraid to speak, are afraid to see the truth, uh, are afraid to hear what's going on in the world. world. Uh, I have a question, why actually people fear to do that? Is it because they, they want to avoid the reality or is it just easier to uh, not tell the truth that, that uh, they're wasting time, wasting assets, uh, they're wasting all their energy in doing uh, things that are that do not change the world. Okay, thank you very much. There are the, the questions enough for uh, conducting the next lecture. But as you said, that we have to we collect the appointments, so we have you know the time as our time is limited. But uh, the last quarter is yours. And uh, thank you for, for it if you managed to have enough time. Well, starting with an with a easy or simple one, I definitely agree. And I, I don't really agree with Graven. There, there are some interesting points, points where I agree. Um, <clears throat> he has a different approach. I definitely would go for this. There are these BS tasks. It is about... Uh, an, an economy that defines tasks that are there just to maintain the system. They don't make sense and they don't make sense. One point is that we are not talking about it. Why aren't we talking about it? We are not questioning. There are psychological aspects as well and it's easy to, to criticize somebody somewhere and it's difficult to, to criticize somebody who is immediately in front of you. But leaving this aside, uh, we are not questioning, and we are not able, probably, to, to question the fundamental issues. And there I completely agree. Uh, before I had been uh, coming here, I worked in, uh, for two or three years in China, in different positions, in different places, and you find many, Giovanni Arigi, uh, for instance, uh, saying there is this term, but he says Smith in Beijing. And this, I think this is a huge danger of getting Smith to Beijing, meaning getting the linear thinking there, instead of learning what we can learn from this tradition. Now, I would not say this is a great tradition, we just can take it and get it here. But we are socialized by this linear thinking and it is something which I would say is about is, is based on or is that there are four methodological points. It is about methodological individualism. It is about methodological nationalism. It's not about nationalism in political terms as we see it now. It is about we think about even globalization, we think about the European Union as European member states, not as an entire body, not the global economy. We always think in terms of this competition. One of the reasons is methodological solutionism. We need a solution now. We have to produce now with 10, kilo, uh, 10 uh, uh, calories or, or with 20, one kilo, uh, calorie because we need it now, whatever happens later. Sustainability is not built into this uh, methodological uh, solutionism, and it is this now methodological presentism. We have difficulties to think about it uh, in, in terms of, of future developments. I was actually <clears throat> always enjoy teaching. Some people think it may be boring to teach people who kind of uh, at the very beginning of the career. It's so exciting and I was thinking about the, the difficulty we have actually to think about and, and really to think about this. Uh, we are already today producing in a, in a social way. It's, it's the socialization of production. We are producing we's. We are producing not only together by going into the enterprise and producing, they're doing our little thing. 
but we are permanently producing and reproducing these things beyond producing whatever our job is, from a tiny computer producing that or from producing students. This is something very important, I think, and this is something where we may, in a way, come back as well to this idea of commons, production in a collective way. This is, I think, a concrete, if you want, a concrete step to move into this, to say we can organize production in a different way. And of course, there is a, pro there, there is a price to be paid. But there is something we gain from it. And we shouldn't even try to calculate this. We should not think about in terms of social benefits, in terms of uh, time we have. But this is something where I want to come to, to your question uh, in, in terms of methodology. Who decides? Where, where is this point where we can actually decide this is something where we have to stop? Individually, I think it's difficult, coming to your point. Individually, we have to say, I stop here. There is no point in going further, which means I am here without income. I am here without whatever I need. It's not about high standard. This is people who are fortunate in the fortunate situation. They can do it, but we cannot do it. We have to build our image by being part of the easy jet generation, being part of the Adidas runner sportive generation or whatsoever. There are some people, you ask them, and when is your flight leaving? Whenever I say it. So in this situation, there you are free to do what you want. We are not. But there is another point where I think we have to decide, actually, in terms of time. And there I'm going back again to Aristotle or to the ancient Greek, dealing with thinking with time, which was kind of linear, but at the same time it was dividing, actually, uh, go to Hannah Arendt, into these three dimensions of labor, producing what we eat, I'm simplifying, work, producing the table onto which we can put the stuff we eat, and action, sitting around the table, socializing. Now you have this as division, the slaves had to do the labor, and the philosophers I always wanted to be a philosopher when I'm in Athens, walking around, philosophizing and action. Now, the, the question is how not to divide it. The one is doing the labor, the other the action, and some people in between the, 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 the work. But to say whatever we do contributes to, if you want, a redistribution of time. I quoted this. Time is the ultimate measure the ultimate reference point of production of the economic system. And this means time in terms of distribution. What do we have to do? And where we are we actually producing leisure, if you want to simplify this term. And this is something where I think, yes, of course, being sociologist, sociology is important. But it is limited, limiting its uh, importance when we come actually to these three monkeys and say, the story I have to do <coughs> is just to stay in the job, getting there, doing whatever I'm asked to do, whatever the result is. Critical research is needed. Again, to your question, Thomas, we need the conditions and we don't have them. So we are caught in something, um, I made this reference, uh, at, at the end, uh, Bansky's um, uh, shredded painting. There's something to conclude with Hannah Arendt said, not cruelty is the attribute of tyranny, but the destruction of the public political realm, monopolized by the despot by claiming wisdom, or based on thirst for power, i.e. insisting on citizens looking after their private concerns, this is what you do, individualism, 
and leaving it to him, to the tyrant, uh, the ruler, to take, of, uh, take care of public affairs. I think it is very much about gaining in production and gaining everywhere public spaces, regaining them and being able to define our, our goals, not as an individual, but in discourse. And this is not just about talking. We talk, I'll stop here. We talk too much instead of really engaging in debates as well and possibly even especially in academia. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we got so much information. You know, today I've heard that it's uh, only one volume of New York Times, weekend volume. There are so much information, so much information that it could cover all information from the average people, average men from a night of time, from the whole, whole time, from whole living. And that's uh, in the next two weeks, the information will be produced in the amount we produced in earlier 2000 years. So it's tremendous. So now we have to, you know, think and organize the production of information we got from Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you for the lecture. <laughs> mm -hmm.